What many of us do for a living is attend meetings, bad meetings. The tragedy of today's business is while we spend a large part of the working day in a room or forum with other business colleagues, and everyone feels a benefit from calling a meeting. But few of us actually benefit from attending. Al Pitampali suggests our meeting culture is changing how we focus, what we focus on, and most important, what decisions we make. That said, meetings are the way we make change and change is how we grow. We need meetings to ensure that intelligent decisions are made and to confirm that our teams are interacting effectively on complex projects. What we don't need, though, are mediocre meetings, meetings that actually and actively cripple our organization. In a world with fewer meetings, we'd have more time for our real work, the work we do that actually propels the organization forward. The sad thing is we're now addicted to meetings that insulate us from the work we ought to be doing. Eliminating this constraint, we might finally have the time to do what's important, not just what we think is urgent. The Read It From Me Idea Code is a shorthand system to help you memorize the core concepts so you can quickly apply them in any situation. The Read It For Me code for this week is TCTCM. T equals tradition. Meetings occur because we traditionally hold them. C equals change the game. Have meetings when you need to decide something that will change the game. T equals toxic meetings. Convenient, formality, and social meetings are toxic. C equals conversations instead. Most meetings could be replaced with a simple conversation between two people. And finally, M, the modern meeting. There are seven rules to the modern meeting. Lesson number one, the risk of tradition. Put in Pally suggests traditional meetings, the type most of us hold at work, generate two major risks to business. They generate a culture of compromise and they kill our sense of urgency. Consider Yahoo. In 2006, in his infamous peanut butter manifesto, Brad Garlinghouse, the VP of Communications at the time, spoke out of the dilemma at Yahoo. We must embrace our problems and challenges and that we must take decisive action. We have the opportunity, in fact, the invitation, to send a strong, clear, and powerful message to our shareholders in Wall Street, to our advertisers and partners, to our employees, both current and future, and to our users. They are all begging for a signal that we recognize and understand our problems and that we're charting a course for fundamental change. Our current course and speed simply will not get us there. Short-term band-aids will not get us there. So what was the problem? Again, in Garlinghouse's words, we lack a focused, cohesive vision for our company. We want to do everything and be everything to everyone. We've known this for years, talk about it incessantly, but do nothing to fundamentally address it. All talk and no action. The entire world was now watching to see what Yahoo would do but nothing decisive followed. No real action took place. They stagnated. During the birth of Web 2.0, the age of Google and Twitter and Facebook and Groupon, Yahoo, the company that could have won, did nothing. The reason that Yahoo failed is simple. By default, Yahoo had adopted a culture of failed meetings. Those meetings killed action and most of all created a culture of compromise. Lesson number two, change the game. When was the last time you made a game-changing decision that made our hearts race? Instead of a meeting structure that demands that we make and defend strong decisions, the broken meeting system we've adopted enables us to pass off responsibility too easily. Great decisions involve risk, and risk scares people. It's natural for great ideas to get attacked, or worse, ignored. When a revolutionary idea is brought to our meetings, and many have been, no one takes ownership. The bystander effect takes over. The committee adopts the decision, the idea gets watered down, the corners are cut off, and the result is a safe or no decision, creating little change and little hope for a better future. This is a pandemic. For example, at the British Broadcasting Company, significant purchases often require six or more meetings by different boards and review panels. Regularly interrupting the day to bring our best minds together to focus on the urgent makes it impossible for them to spend time focusing their energy on what's actually important. It's real work that moves us forward, work that involves action, struggle, and effort. It's that output that puts us closer to winning. David Hennemeyer Hansen from 37 Signals puts it succinctly. He believes meetings are toxic because it breaks work days into a series of work moments. Efficient systems should be organized around the output that wants to be optimized. In our case, the work. But with so many meetings called, it's as if our work has been organized around our meetings instead. Lesson number three, the toxic meeting. 
Pitt and Pally informs us of three types of toxic meetings. First, convenience meetings. These type of meetings are called because it's difficult to capture everything we want to say effectively in writing quickly. That said, convenience meetings rarely add any more value than a memo would have. In fact, they're worse because in addition to wasting time, they rely on nonverbal communication that's hard to refer to later on. Ever try recording body language? Formality meetings. These meetings are generally called by managers who think it's their job to hold them. Whether these meetings are designed to give off the appearance of control and productivity, or whether they're a way for managers to subtly exert their status, these meetings are wasteful. Even if having convening members get together to share advice or status reports results in some incremental benefit, it pales in comparison to the cost of the interruption. Lastly, social meetings. Social meetings are for the purpose of connection. We sometimes call social meetings without even realizing it. I'm guilty of this myself. Unfortunately, social meetings quickly turn circular and expand to fit the time. You might want to slow down and chat, but perhaps not everyone in the room has the same goals or time that you do. Keep it for the gym. Lesson number four, let's not have a meeting. A conversation is a real-time dialogue between two people. It's not a meeting. Conversations are easy to control, easy to decline, and normally an effective form of communication. Unlike meetings, conversations are not weapons of mass interruption. Let's have a conversation. A group work session is exactly what it sounds like. It's not a meeting. It's real work done simultaneously with other team members, intra-team, and often ad hoc. The focus is creation. The purpose is clear, and the session includes only team members who interact with each other on a regular basis. Let's have a group work session instead. Brainstorms are magical sessions specifically designed for generating lots of ideas. A brainstorm is not a meeting. Let's have a brainstorm. Meetings are too expensive and disruptive to justify using them for most common types of communication, like making announcements, clarifying issues, or even gathering intelligence. Let's not have a meeting. Lesson number five, let's have a modern meeting. This is Pitt and Pally's key manifesto. The modern meeting is a special instrument, a sacred tool that exists for only one reason, to support decisions. Decisions have always been what moves us to act. They precede all change. Brave decisions lead to a brave organization. Fearful decisions lead to a fearful one. We must structure the modern meeting so that bold decisions happen often and quickly, and those decisions are converted into movement that leads our organization forward fearlessly. Number one, the modern meeting supports a decision that has already been made. We should gather only as much input and advice from others as is necessary to make our decision. No need for data overload. However, before we can make that decision, we cannot call a meeting. Modern meetings can't exist without a decision to support. Not a question to discuss, a decision. If you need someone's input pre-decision, get it from them personally, one-to-one. -one. Have a conversation with them less convenient for you, but that's the point. You're the one who has to make that decision. If the decision is controversial, get buy-in from the group one by one. In the end, though, it's you that will make the decision. Number two, the modern meeting moves fast and ends on schedule. Traditional meetings seem to go on forever, with no end in sight. When the clock runs out, we add more time or even worse, more meetings. Strong deadlines force parties to resolve the hard decisions necessary for progress. With too much time, even the most unshakable decisions will be reconsidered. Arguments turn circular, the same points occur over and over again without more real information. Keep a meeting as brief as possible and set a firm end time. Every minute that you're sitting with five or seven key people is a minute that's costing the company a fortune. Spend it wisely. Number three, the modern meeting limits the number of attendees. When we try to reach an agreement in our meetings, the number of actual agreements that need to take place rises exponentially as more people are added to the group. When there are too many conflicting views, there's rarely any basis for an agreement. Worse still, having people merely watch wastes their time and diminishes their stature. In the modern meeting, we invite only the people who are absolutely necessary for resolving the decision that's been presented. From now on, if you're invited to a meeting where you don't belong or won't contribute, Please don't attend. Number four, the modern meeting rejects the unprepared. Preparation starts with the meeting leader. He must create an agenda and a set of background materials. 
Preparing an agenda involves thinking through what's going to happen at the meeting, what the objectives are, who should be invited, what they should bring, and how long the meeting should last. The agenda should clearly state the problem, the alternatives, and the decision. It should outline exactly the sort of feedback requested, and it should end with a statement of what the meeting will deliver, if it's successful. Most importantly, agendas demand preparation on the part of the attendees. Any information for getting attendees up to speed should be given out beforehand. If the attendee doesn't have time to read and prepare, they don't have time to attend. Number five, the modern meeting produces committed action plans. In traditional meetings, minutes were recorded. In the modern meeting, minutes are not required. All we need to know is the decision and the resulting action plan. The plan should include at least the following. What actions are we committing to? Who is responsible for each action? When will those actions be completed? After the meeting, the leader should make sure participants are doing what they agreed to do when they agreed to do it. Hold them accountable. If you don't, who's going to do it? Completed action plans show the meeting participants that the time they spend in the conference room wasn't in vain. The meeting worked. Number six, the modern meeting refuses to be informational. Reading memos is mandatory. Meetings must be kept for decisions. The only way to do so is to cancel the informational meetings. That said, we must make a pact of reading the memos. If we don't read the memo, the pact is broken and the informational meeting returns. Information has to be shared in coherent, cogent documents. These must be complete thoughts that are actually worth reading and responding to and indicate true priority. Number seven, the modern meeting works only alongside a culture of brainstorming. The brainstorm is the anti-meeting, the counterweight that sits on the other end of the scale opposite the modern meeting given the system balance. The goal of the brainstorming is to break free from the fear that often restricts people's creativity. The ground rules. One, invite people who are passionate about the idea. Two, praise liberally and encourage participation. Number three, number ideas, seek large numbers. Four, use a timer and create urgency. Number five, have some fun for goodness sake, get active. Number six, let's not invite the boss. And number seven, let's write it all down, capture the essence of the brainstorm. In conclusion, before you arrange another meeting, ask yourself the following questions. Can I make this decision myself? If a group is necessary, how and when should I involve this group? Does the opinion of someone else matter or are the facts sufficient? Can I do this with a conversation instead of a meeting? And how much time should this decision take? And finally, what should the next step be? Hi, I'm Rhonda. And this is an exclusive audiobook video recorded for the Audiobook Master Channel. Enjoy your audiobook and have fun learning. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll get updated on our next upload. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up and say your thoughts about the book we just covered. Do you want to listen to a summary or review of a book that we haven't covered in the past? Say it in the comments below or send us a message. Don't forget to check our other uploads. Enjoy listening!